Good morning and welcome back. My name is Matt and this is a uh, six-week Bible study I'm doing leading up to Easter. We are on uh, week three. Part three is uh, God's Word and how God speaks to us. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on week three and I hope you're enjoying this series so far and um, we got uh, three more weeks to go. So here goes. Oh and if you are local or in the area this starts March 12th. We're going to be at my house every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. So if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you. All right. So week three, God's word. How does God speak to us? There is a huge difference in knowing how to play basketball or the game of basketball and actually playing the game of basketball. We're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. It says this, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the lord jesus christ God's word is going to add to your faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly love, brotherly kindness, and love. We become effective men for Christ when we are adding to our lives. The Christian life is meant to be finished upon death, meaning that if we stop growing, then we are either dead or we're dying. We must push ourselves to the point of uncomfort. A memory burned in my brain was my elderly grandparents, who I loved dearly. I never knew them to be strong in their faith, but I can still remember my parents making the choice to go every week. Or to, I'm sorry, my parents to make a choice to go to a very young church that had loud music, lighting, and effects. My grandmother would say often that she didn't care for the style of service, but that she would never miss because she knew if she came, the rest of the family would come as well. We must be men who are willing to sacrifice our desires for the lost souls around us. Peter uses some strong words to describe the person who stops growing in their faith. Unproductive, nearsighted, blind, has forgotten what Jesus did for them. You can run from your past or who you used to be, but never forget who you used to be without Jesus. We need to burn into our memory what Jesus we need to burn into our memory that without Jesus we were absolutely a mess. Flipping over to Second Timothy Chapter three verses five through fifteen through seventeen. And how from infancy you knew you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God's Word, it makes us wise for salvation, Paul told Timothy. Sometimes you will be the only Bible that lost people will ever know. Not meaning that we must live perfect lives, but we must show the way in how to live. But we must show the way in how to live repentant lives. When we screw up, be quick to accept responsibility and show your willingness to change. Useful for teaching, useful for rebuking and correcting training in righteousness. As a Christian, everything hinges on what this book, the Bible, is to you. And so from like on a scale from one to five here, I want you to just think of like one on one being on this side and five being on this side. And as a Christian, everything hinges on what we think the Bible is and what we believe the Bible is. So for some on the one side, on a one, for some the Bible is completely fantasy. It's completely made up. It's just a good novel. For others, it's a history book. Maybe some of it happened, but surely not all of it. Right there in the middle, number three is for someone, for some, 
It is only the New Testament that we should follow, and no need to follow the Old. So we look at the New, but the Old, you know, that's kind of dated. We don't need to use that anymore. Some view the Bible as a guide, but not to be taken 100% seriously, or completely true. It was written by a man, and therefore will have some errors. This is somewhere I put right around the four area. And then we have the five, all the way over on the, this side over here. And it says, For others, the Bible is God's word written by men but guided by the spirit without error nor blemish and meant to be followed so what is god's word the bible to you and why does it even matter what you believe about the bible how we view our bible will change your perspective about how we live it out from that one through five perspective in the previous section a person leaning closer to that one side will read their bible for any given reason but that will be it. It's a story and nothing more. This person may be quick to pick up some good quotes and learn some wise proverbs, but at the end of the day, it won't change any decision making nor my view of God and the world. For those leaning more towards that five side over here, the Bible becomes something they build their entire lives around and on. They view each word as a word spoken from God and preserved by God through the generations of history. This person allows each word to shape their identity, their choices, and sets the course for their future. Is the Bible a book of promises? Or is the Bible really just a long, long novel? Your answer is going to affect everything. Flipping over to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verses 25 through 35. It reads, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think about what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore it is written, Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Growing up, I remember sitting in the church pews of our old Baptist church, and I always was looking for God to physically show up in a way that I could see him. I played games like asking God to speak out loud to me, make a star fall from the sky, guess the number that I was thinking, and so on. I was like that. I was looking for that physical proof. I, was, I have always been floored how people in Jesus' day could look past all these impossible things that were happening, the signs and the wonders. The Bible refers to these as the signs and wonders. What gets me even more is how, the good, how we, I'm sorry, what gets me even more is how good we as humans are in overlooking or explaining away the miracles we see. Jesus knew without the heart a man's without the heart man's heart would always wander even if we saw undeniable proof God doesn't think God doesn't think like we do God doesn't value the same things we do this is the critical step that so many Christians that Chris this is a critical this is the critical step that so many Christian events fail to establish making Jesus our Savior and our Lord. Everyone wants to be saved. I think of a burning building or being stuck on the roof. Surely they will, they will want to be saved, but will that result in them installing a smoke detector in their next home? Making Jesus our Lord is the hard part of salvation. It's not only laying down your life, but also changing, the ways, changing your ways to line up with God's ways. This is living inside of God's will. 
God is made strong when we appear weak. If my life, if my life, I'm sorry, if my wife, <laughs> if my wife, who is very educated and smart, gets an A on a test, people can easily look at her and say, yeah, she's smart, she studies well, and she's a good student, so of course she got an A. Now, on the other hand, if I, who am not a very good test taker, get an A, there's simply no explanation for this. This happened to me personally many times. I struggled with addiction for many years, and as, and it started out early in my life with my eating habits. I weighed over 340 pounds and could never lose weight. After I surrendered my life to Jesus, he gave me the power I needed to end the addiction battles in my life, from food to drugs to alcohol, tobacco, porn, work, and so on. The 12, the 12 disciples and Paul are even greater examples of this. Uneducated, blue-collar workers and had questionable character before meeting Jesus. If people can explain why you do what you do, well, then it just appears normal. When we begin to stretch and push ourselves past what we think is possible, it leaves room for God to show up. Don't play it safe when it comes to your faith. Let God prove how real He is through how you live your life. Don't let religion slip in. Paul calls this being conceited. We live our lives in order to point people to Jesus, not ourselves. Always remember where your next breath comes from, your strength, your wisdom, and so, and so on are all the gifts God has given to, to you to use for His will and not your own. Take some time this week and think about your journey in life, who you used to be and the struggles you used to have. The power of Jesus is shown when people see the transformation in us. Write out how your story Write your story, write out how your story can point people to Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, reads like this. Three times I pleaded with you, Lord, to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in, in insults, and in hardships, and persecution, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong." Your story can be two verses long and be effective. Paul begged God to take something away. God said no, and Paul shared a story about how through his weakness, Jesus' power was shown. Your story doesn't have to be a long story of rags to riches. It doesn't have to have a thrilling this and a thrilling that. Your story is your story, and God gave you your story for a reason. He's got a purpose for you. Flipping over to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul gives us a clear reminder of the men we used to be, our old self, and then the transition you made to becoming a Christian, your new self, now living a life that models Jesus. While this is a great reminder for us to be like Christ, this also serves as a great reminder that lost people are not going to look, act, talk, or have morals like Christians do. Like ourselves before we met Jesus, lost people will be a mess, and we must be the men that welcome them with open arms. We must be willing to walk with them as they begin to transition from their old self to their new self. It isn't easy at all to give up your to give up your comfort. It may even be the burnt 
you, it may even mean that you are the brunt of their abuse when they struggle. But being patient is mentioned first in the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 for a reason. Remember, all the good things God has given you, the wisdom, the hard work ethic, wisdom, being wise with money, those are gifts from God, not from your own doing. God gives gifts not for you to use just for yourself, but to share with others. So use your gifts to help others around you start taking steps closer to Jesus. In conclusion, I'm going to flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 14, or I'm sorry, chapter 4. Starting in verse 13, going through the first part of 14. Until I come, devote yourself to the public, te public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given to you through the prophetic message. Do not neglect your gift. There is real power in the gospel. Don't be ashamed nor fearful but rather proclaim its truths in the way you live. Submit yourself to God's word. Human wisdom gets you into trouble when we start picking things we do and don't believe out of God's word. All this does is water down the gospel and weakens your faith and your effectiveness. Finishing that section in verses 15 through 16, it says, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Preserve, persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. When God shows up in your life, tell people. When God promises you something and when it happens, tell people. Be the proof that God's word is real that God's Word is living, that God's Word is active. Your neighbors, your family, your co-workers, etc. are not interested in what you have to say about your faith. Rather, they, rather they want you, they are interested in what you can show about your faith. Faith is about actions, not just words. All right, guys, that is week three of our Bible study about how God speaks to us. we got three more weeks. I hope you continue to join us. I hope you have a great rest of your morning.